Well, thank you for uh, the kind invitation to uh, present uh, this information. I was asked to talk on um, the fluvial system and its changes, river sediment and their fluxes, and the impact on downstream deltas. I have a number of movies for your entertainment, um, so I hope you enjoy them. But let's begin with uh, a little bit on sediment production. So we release a lot of sediment from doing by just manipulating the land surface. It might be these agricultural terraces that th are throughout South America and Asia and other parts of the world. The, the upper right image is a satellite image looking down on the terraces and you can see gullying on the sides of these terraces. So building the terraces themselves are designed to withhold the water and grow agricultural crops, but they are often put on landscapes that are subject to in soil instability and they themselves create a lot of sediment. The lower two images are the shocking ones. We've, we've removed entire mountain tops uh, for coal mining. This is from the US. And just a, a, an unbelievable statistic is that in the U.S. alone, there are 500,000, 568,000 abandoned mines. And you can multiply that times 10 for the whole world. So we have about 5 million abandoned mines around the world. In some of my talk, I use the term gigatons and not everyone knows what a gigaton is. So if you were to multiply the thousands of kilometers of the Great Wall of China by its meters high and its many meters wide, you get around 0.4 gigatons. So one gigaton of material is about 2.5 Great Walls of China. So when I say a gigaton, you can do the math, you multiply it by 2.5, and you get the number of Great Walls. So the Palm Islands of Dubai is 7.5 Great Walls of China. The Hong Kong airport utilized 0.6 gigatons of sediment. And this is the kind of uh, movement of sediment that humans do. But our mining of, the, of our Earth resources is truly staggering. And coal production, we're mining at, right now we're mining at nine gigatons per year. And if you go to the industry websites that I have done, they're suggesting that they'll be mining by 2030, 13 gigatons per year, per year. So you have to multiply that by two, uh, two and a half uh, Great Walls of China, and there you go. The, great, the global iron production is 2.2 gigatons. The global hydraulic cement is 2.2. The global aggregate, aggregates are sand and gravel. Production globally is 13 gigatons. Well, 13 gigatons is all the sediment moved by all the rivers around the world today. So we are moving more sediment by all the natural processes. And those natural processes might be by movement of water, movement of ice, or movement by wind. So humans rock, for better or worse. So this is a map of the dams in the United States. And you can see the migration of the Europeans across the continent. You see the year ticking by on top. And you see the dams proliferating in the country. I call it my Matrix movie. It's incredible. So I, I've zoomed in in this box, and I've got a satellite image that was processed just to look at all the water on that, within that box. You can see the Mississippi River that comes down to the Mississippi Delta 
barely. But all those other black areas, those are reservoirs that are behind the dams. Sometimes you see them as light blue. That's because they're trapping sediment that would otherwise get to the coastline. I've made a movie for the entire world. These are just the giant dams because I can't put all the small dams on. It would look ugly. So these large dams are the 45 meter plus dams in height. And you'll see, watch 1952 come by and China click on. It's almost instant. So this is a phenomena that's truly global. We have built one large dam on average every day for the last 130 years. One of the things that we worry about in climate change is the intensification of the hydrological cycle. If you put warm temperature on the Earth's surface, you will put more water vapor into the atmosphere. That will come down as rainfall. It will spin up cyclones and hurricanes, tornadoes. But we have a very hard time separating the engineering failures from all of this massive structure that we put on the river surface from this intensification of the water. So my group within CSDMS, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, we, we, produce, we map the Earth's surface on a daily basis, and we map where all the floods are every day, twice a day, actually. And we map the intensification of the floods, the area that's flooded, the discharge, all of that from space. And these diagrams show two um, curves. The upper one is the very high magnitude floods, which tr is trending up, although in the last few years it looks like it's going down. And the lower one is lower, lower intensity floods um, that show a more uh, linear increase over the last number of years that we've been mapping. One of our maps is from the Chalfreya Delta. All the area in uh, red is a flooded land. The area of that map is around uh, a few hundred kilometers wide by uh, 600 kilometers in length. And so the question is, well, is this an example of the intensification of the world's hydrological cycle from global warming? In fact, in this case, there was a cyclone that was I shouldn't say cyclone, that's my mistake. There was a mon heavy monsoon system coming onto the land. They had stored too much water in the reservoir. The dam operator got scared. They released the water rather than to let the dam open up um, through mechanical failure, and they caused the flood. So this was a human-induced flood. So when we map floods, we're not always mapping something that's tied to climate where the floods are tied to human engineering. This is a set of uh, satellite images. It's a movie. Uh, if you've not seen these, they're kind of great. It shows that our hydrological system, a river, is alive. It moves, it flows, it changes its course, its shape. But we also put towns on these floodplains. And this has become is an ever-growing phenomena. And when you get into the well-developed world, such as Europe, the Havel River here flowing through Berlin, it's become more of a sluice rather than a river that is alive in movement due to morphodynamics. This is a shocking diagram. Everywhere you see a large red circle, that means the discharge has decreased by more than 30%. And so it looks like most of the river systems of Asia, Africa, Australia have decreased in their discharge. Yet I've just said that global warming is increasing the hydrological cycle through a, a water vapor intensification. 
So this decrease in discharge is simply because we now pull out the water from these reservoirs for agricultural purposes, industrial purposes, drinking water supply. We are basically growing crops in deserts. Where you see green, that's another story. Uh, where I live in the Boulder, Colorado, we pull water from one side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain. And so we shift and we increase the discharge. In addition, in the US, we're really great at pumping water out of the ground, and that also increases the discharge of these rivers. So I'm known for this diagram, so let me just spend a few seconds on it. So global warming through adding an, uh, water to the ocean surface through melting ice caps, ice sheets, and from warming the ocean surface through uh, steric effect is increasing by just about three millimeters per year today what the ocean is increasing, okay? Just a few millimeters. But if you looked at the coastlines of around the world, it looks like sea level is rising many times that. And that's because we're subsiding the land as the ocean is going up. So for the half a billion people that are living on the coast, on these deltas, they're facing not just sea level rise, but land subsidence. And when we look at some of the causes, it could be on the, your uh, upper uh, right, you see the pole delta in, uh, near Venice, but in upper Italy. And this used to be uh, from methane mining. It was sinking at about 60 millimeters per year. It was sinking so fast, they stopped the methane mining through feedback from Venice. Uh, and, and with that, they reduce this land subsidence. Chalfreya, it's the middle upper diagram. They were sinking at 100 millimeters per year. So that's, that's order of magnitude greater than what sea level rise is happening. And that was from pumping up water for agricultural purposes. They've since introduced a tax to slow that down. The Jakarta, the figure on the upper left, in places, that's now uh, four meters below sea level in the last 35 years alone. And that's from uh, infrastructure within the city. We have new satellite techniques that could detect vertical changes of one millimeter, one millimeter every few months on the land surface. And we're able to zone in where on these deltas, these flat areas, is the subsidence occurring in China they often occur in areas where they're pumping up water for fish farms. And there the sinking is one meter every four years. So we've been talking about millimeters of sea level rise. Well, they have another more fundamental problem, don't they? So in summary, I'm going to play you a movie and I'll wrap it up with a couple of slides. Rivers run down mountains through forest, flow through desert and delta, course through bended bay and swerving shore, and recirculate back from our ocean. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Access to water has defined where human populations have flourished. Civilization emerged between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq. Now we are changing the carbon and nitrogen cycles. We are altering the global water system too, through damming, extraction, irrigation and climate change. Many rivers no longer reach the sea. We move more sediment than natural erosion and rivers. We've built 48,000 large dams. We've drained half of global wetlands. We use an area the size of South America to grow our crops, an area the size of Africa for our livestock. Agriculture accounts for 70% of global freshwater use, and we need to feed a growing population. In a single lifetime, we've become a phenomenal global force. 
We're pushing Earth into a new geological epoch. The Anthropocene, dominated by humanity. We have altered Earth's snow cover, sea ice and ocean volume, fundamental elements of the water cycle. Climate change will bring more flooding, drought and disease. A warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. This is causing the water cycle to intensify. Wet regions are becoming wetter, dry areas drier. Rainfall patterns are changing. Damming, mining and extraction are causing two-thirds of major deltas to sink. Almost 800 million people have no safe drinking water. 2.4 billion remain without adequate sanitation. 1.7 billion people live in places where groundwater is being extracted faster than it can be replenished. Four out of five people worldwide face risk to their water security. For water security for all, we urgently need innovative and creative approaches to policy from local to global. With nations competing for limited resources, we must find better ways to manage them. And we must adapt to a changing water cycle. This is the challenge of water in the Anthropocene. So that was a movie that my organization, IGBP, uh, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, um, put out. It's put out a number of these. You can download them, uh, the movies, on our website. This next, uh, the final two slides, very quickly, is, is really the elephant in the room. You know, part of this is the uh, population pressure that we have that's the statistic that I like to mention is that we're going to be adding a one million person city every 10 days for the next 86 years. And so we have a little social commentary. We have two worlds that we could look towards, the built world and the, and the natural world. Thank you very much.